Okay, welcome back from the break. Um, I heard lots of uh, great conversations taking place out there. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Peter Goodhand. Um, for all of those who've tried to introduce themselves in the last hour and I've ignored you because I was finding somebody else, I apologize and I will talk to you later, I promise. Uh, we're move moving into the next session, which is a continuation of our working groups uh, telling you what they've been up to and leaving time for you to tell us where we need to head in, in the next phase of our work together. Um, the data working group met yesterday, probably had 60 or 70 people uh, in many, many different groups, uh, tremendous amount of energy. And I'm going to pass over to David Hausler and Richard Durbin to take you through where they are today and where they're heading in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and tell you about the work of the data working group. And it was a very exciting day yesterday. Uh, the problem, as David outlined and, and Keith in his opening remarks, are that uh, really no institute has enough data on their own to, to make the progress we need to make. And those data are being siloed in different medical institutions, both uh, universities and other uh, medical institutions. And from a software point of view, even worse, uh, the institutions uh, that are holding these data are implementing, kind of doing their own thing, right? They'll, they'll hire uh, people to do it, or they'll even have postdocs uh, build this infrastructure, and you end up with a lot of incompatible stuff um, and unprofessional approaches. And this really reinforces the state or the, this, this, the other, the political and other reasons why we have a hard time data sharing. Uh, so we, we definitely want to lower the bar on these technical reasons. There should be no technical reason you can't share data. Uh, why should institutions really think instead about building their own silo and their own infrastructure, why should they work with us and work with the global community? I think there are Obviously, the reason is scientific. We have to have the statistical power. We really need to understand and treat disease. Keith made that very clear. Uh, it's much more economical. It's really cheaper to do it in the open source, large scale community. And patient empowerment is a, something that I think we all have to be serious about. The patients will be better served in a federated global uh, system where you can easily move from institution to institution. So uh, the API platform is trying to create a way of sharing genomic data. We are going to operate in some kind of cloud-based infrastructure, whether it be commercial, private cloud, some combination of those. Uh, the idea of cloud computing is that we leverage some of the big advantages uh, to large scale. Uh, that means hardware and storage costs are reduced by very large purchases. Equipment is used over many different sectors of the economy and so can be amortized appropriately. Uh, the um, location of data centers turns out to be very uh, important just from the cost of electricity and other considerations. Uh, design costs, of course, for these massive enterprises are amortized over huge user base. Security, uh, you heard from Dixie and Paul uh, that there are, uh, uh, a, there's a rational plan forward with security and these uh, institutions have proven that they are up to that task. Uh, elasticity is the thing that's most often mentioned about cloud. The cost of one computer for a thousand hours is the same as the cost of a thousand computers for one hour. You can't do that in your own medical center. Uh, so this is really important, that, that elasticity. And then finally, the globalization of this, which is so important. Uh, our operating mode is the mode of open source, which is a well-established mode now. Um, we use uh, geek sites like uh, this one. In fact, this is our home base now in terms of the actual code, schemas, methods. Uh, GitHub is a, great, uh, is a great collaborative tool. Uh, many, many open source communities use it. Uh, all groups are welcome to participate. Any, if you're from a company or from a, a university or uh, a, uh, any other kind of institute. The decision making within the group is uh, 
done by a fascinating methodology. The Apache Open Source Foundation has a very rapid turnaround decision making. Basically, three plus ones, and uh, it's decided uh, if there aren't a lot of comments. And we'll tell you about minus one later. Um, Leadership is determined by the amount of contribution, and we have a very, very simple mantra, which is the most important thing. Collaborate on the interface and compete on the implementation. So we are really cutting it both ways, and that is the way that the industry in all other sectors has moved forward. We need to move forward in the same way. So uh, we have started out with uh, five task teams. The file formats task team is designed to take what we're currently doing in the actual real world deployed implementations of bioinformatics for large genome data, namely the uh, BAM, SAM formats and the VCF format, and bring it up to the appropriate standards for industrial use, prepare it for clinical use. Uh, the genomics read task team is trying to then translate that file-based world into an applications programming interface world, which is a more abstract concept, which captures the essence of the data in a scheme that can be implemented in many different ways. It, you don't have to have a specific file format for this. And it's more flexible and will allow uh, much more powerful collaboration as we start to scale from hundreds, thousands to uh, ultimately a million genome level. The reference variation task team looks at the case of how we actually understand the existing human variation. Can we combine some of the good things uh, that happen with the GRCH uh, coordination of our reference genome and dbSNP coordination of our reference variation and all of these spectacular tools so that uh, we can use them simultaneously? And then how do we represent genetic variation, including new variation that's not in our catalog of current refer uh, reference variation? Uh, in, a, in a unique and uh, consistent way. Uh, the metadata task team carries on a very important task of looking at all the other data that is associated with this enterprise, not just the genome data, uh, how you got the sample, it, the individual it was taken from, what tissue type, all of these things are very, very important. Uh, the benchmarking task team finally makes sure that it all really works, that we're not just blowing smoke on this thing and that everybody can take advantage of standardized benchmarks and they can measure their implementation against everybody else's. So uh, to look at a little detail on each of the task teams, uh, I'll go over these quickly, but the file formats task team is looking at the existing uh, file specifications and building on top of those. And in particular, I want to highlight CRAM, which is a new uh, version of BAM it's at least 30% less disk space, and that's real dollars. Anybody who's calculated the cost of storing uh, hundreds of thousands of genomes knows that translates into very real dollars. Uh, and we potentially could have much better savings with CRAM if we allow something like we do um, with the, in the image world here, we have JPEG as, a, as a, a kind of an example. When you transfer an image, you don't necessarily need to transfer all of the bits. If it may be a very high resolution image, you can downsample a little bit and still have complete functionality. So we can downsample genomes in, in a rational way, and we need to do that. Uh, the the Reed's uh, benchmarking team was really the first one out of the gates and uh, has been a, a key core for developing the actual methodology of how to run a task team, as well as uh, really uniting all of the other task teams in a common product set, which we call version 0.5. Uh, so that version is out there. It supplants version 0.1. We had a number of implementations, but these are all of our schemas and all of our methods for extracting, querying data, transferring data, that is defined within these data schemas. There are three uh, initial implementations of 0.1, and we have a, a number of emerging ones. Google with the first one just out of the gate of version 0.5.1, a little bit of a tweak on that. And uh, 
Importantly, with every one of these APIs comes a compliance test suite. So if you have a new implementation of this, you can run it against a whole bunch of programs that ensure uh, that that implementation is valid. A reference implementation fully open source is underway, and we're getting close to that. We have browsers uh, implementations that are now built on that, and batch processing. So browsers for your casual use uh, of the data, and batch processing for serious use use of analysis of thousands of genomes at once. Both of those are extreme ends of the spectrum of how we want to deal with data, and we believe that the API will support both. Now, the reference variation task team, as I said earlier, is involved in how we represent information, and currently we have a lot of information about human genetic variation in different sources. Uh, we want to harmonize that. We're working with the, the Genome Reference Consortium to do so. We had a wonderful meeting yesterday about that. And uh, when we actually uh, converge on representing novel variants, uh, we'll be able to translate those into all of the existing nomenclatures for representing human genetic variation. So far, we've agreed on version 0.5, so we actually have uh, schemas for initially for representing human genetic variation in version 0.5. There are multiple uh, API implementations of that at this point, and coming is this notion that you see at the bottom. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, Gil McVean's description of the uh, major histocompatibility complex region, the MHC region of the human genome, and uh, really what we currently have in the standard reference uh, is one path through this is the standard reference, the primary path that most people to try to map their data to, and then we have seven alternates now which represent a sampling of some of these other paths through this that different people on the planet take within their MHC regions. Uh, but the true variation of that is much richer than what we currently capture, and we want to try to capture that in the long run. Uh, the metadata team uh, again has a number of products that they've produced for the different aspects. Uh, of uh, the rest of the data. GA experiment is uh, looking at the uh, issues of how you got the data, what experiment you used to get the data, individual about the individual that contributed the data and the group that that individual came from, uh, particular analysis methodologies that were used to generate the data, like how you mapped the reads, for example, and uh, the biological sample inform inform information about the tissue. So there are a number of issues and next steps we have on that. Um, it's very important to standardize the way we refer to these issues. We can't force everybody to use all of the same items, but if we have a standard set of items to choose from, we'll be in uh, much better shape. Uh, benchmarking task team has made very dramatic progress uh, after, after starting uh, quite recently. Uh, they have uh, a number of pipelines uh, that are available now uh, to look at uh, how you're actually performing uh, when you um, release a new piece of software, uh, in particular if you are trying to call variants, which is their first task, uh, the presence or absence of a genetic variant in the sample, uh, they will measure the false positive rate, uh, the, the rate of uh, uh, false negatives, and so forth. Um, finally, we're incubating four new task teams that just got born uh, essentially out of the meeting yesterday. Uh, these have been in the works for a while, but they were solidified yesterday. RNA and gene expression task team is an incredibly important task team that deals with the other part of the genome, the RNA, and ultimately its translation into protein. The genome annotation task team looks at the way we represent uh, features on the genome sequence that are used in browsers. Genotype to phenotype association looks at the bridge between the data working group and the clinical working group and how do we actually, what is the semantics, what's the ontology for the different types of association that we can express between genotype and phenotype and how is that used in a machine learning environment or another uh, statistical assessment environment to see how good we're doing. Uh, the containers and workflow team uh, are, are all about portability. We're working with the three projects that you'll hear more about, Genomic Matchmaker, Beacon, and BRCA Challenge. And then finally, I want to 
just give you a taste of one of the important ideas that's come out of this effort with the data working group. And that was discussed yesterday and it's been discussed for a while, the idea of globally unique content-based identifiers. So uh, many of you who aren't in the, in the kind of geek world um, may not know that there are techniques based on hashing to not like hashtags that you have on Twitter, <laughs> but a different, a, a different method uh, that allow you to do a remarkable thing. So for example, we have and we will produce a concrete technology so that any version of any genome in the world can have an abstract identifier that's one, unique for that genome. All copies of the genome will have the same identifier anywhere and no two different genomes will get the same identifier. Privacy pre uh, preserving, you can't really learn anything about the genome from the identifier itself. It's not assigned by a central authority. There's no requirement that a central authority uh, be involved in the assignment of this identifier, and it's unforgeable. So if I send you uh, someone's genome with a wrong identifier, you immediately can recognize that by a simple computational test. These things are very important for clarity on how we make sure that globally, as we share data, when we talk about something, we know we're referring to the same things. These computational checks involved in this can make sure that we can know that and use that for managing the copy uh, verification, deduplication, there's no uh, sense to store two copies if you know they're identical, uh, and auditing uh, the tracking of reproducible analysis. There's been a lot of discussion about reproducibility uh, and we will guarantee that. So these are the members of the group. I won't go, I'm out of time, so I won't go through these in detail. There are a number of members from the initial uh, group that you see from various institutions all around the world, but I really want to emphasize uh, that Richard Durbin and I um, have been pleased and just totally excited about the fact that the task teams have grown so dramatically and we've combined the list of everybody in all of the task teams. I gave some summary numbers on previous slides, uh, but it is an impressive list uh, of institutions and very talented individuals from around the world. I cannot thank them enough. Uh, there's a couple of pages of this as you go on. <clears throat> excuse me, as you go on through these, uh, they are amazing, an amazing group, and the energy yesterday was really, it was really electric. Uh, we have something that's happening here, it's got momentum, it's got excitement, uh, we can continue this day in and day out on the web. Uh, you see the activity on the discussion sites of the GitHub site is absolutely marvelous, and uh, I want to thank everybody. There's one more slide here that I'm not getting. Um, nope, killed the, killed the whole thing. All right. Uh, yes, so more every day, uh, especially yesterday. It was a very, very good day. We are on a roll. Thank you. So I'd ask, we'll use the same format. We've got uh, about 10 minutes for questions. People could come to the microphone, identify themselves. Um, but while I'm waiting for the first one to come. Richard, have you got anything else to add to that? No, I mean, uh, we <laughs> worked on the slides together, yes, but I, I just want to, uh, you know, reinforce that I think there's an enormous amount of activity and energy and uh, uh, some really interesting things. I think for those of us who've been involved in the sort of academic genome project by informatics, having these additional viewpoints from industry and from other people has, has really, um, has been very interesting. I can see us moving forwards to doing things in a different way that will, will make a difference. So, yeah. And I think, I think maybe David mentioned this back in the London meeting, our scalability, our ability, yeah. capacity is only limited by the number of people who actually come with their energy and their skill, not just with a problem for us. So thank you to that massive list. Mark. Uh, David, very exciting and a huge amount of progress. Just one question, just in relation to engagement with research funding bodies, because they tend to sit also in silos in relation to how they actually uh, deal with um, informatics in general. Have you had any engagement? And the reason why I ask is particularly in relation to cloud-based solutions. Some of the funding agencies, particularly in the UK, are quite restrictive in what type of ways in which you can use the cloud. And I just wondered, have you involved them in the conversation at all? 
Yes, we have very much so. We've been certainly uh, working with the U.S. National Institutes of Health, Genome you know, Canada, Wellcome Trust, uh, and we're expanding to a larger number of funding agencies, all of which who strongly endorse what we're doing and are anxious to participate in a very close relationship with us. That's excellent. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. David, you got a comment to make? Then I'll get to I think, well, maybe, maybe I can comment also on that. I think. You know, you can separate out, there are some sort of policy discussions about uh, that in Europe there are concerns after the Snowden business about US-based companies and, uh, uh, and so on. But you can separate that from the technical issues of the way that people are moving to doing very large-scale computing and data. And so, I, actually, I think there's no problems with the concept that in the appropriate, secure, shared compute environment, you can set up systems which have the same technical structure as cloud, cloud structure. And then there are these, these policy issues, which I think will work their way through. Um, and, and actually, the other, the other working groups are, are, are part of the solution there. Yeah. No, I just want to, uh, that's right, I agree with that. I want to follow up on the funding, mm -hmm. funders uh, question, just to say that, just since we do have everyone in the room, one, that we had a wonderful engagement with a number of funders who are, who. Uh, have strongly uh, uh, stated support and will uh, uh, put their money where their mouth is for this effort. Uh, David actually wrote a grant uh, to this BD2K NIH thing that was funded that talks about doing these things. But in addition, uh, two things what I want to mention in the room. One, we are uh, at advocating for and are optimistic it will be the case that there could be funding to support people actually doing this work. So there's sort of a little bit of funding to have, a, have an alliance and meetings but there's the funding of people to do this work, and that's something that is not ignored. Obviously, it's not in our power, but we're advocating for it. But the other is, if in the places you work, there are funding agencies in your jurisdiction or your country, you might put them in touch, and I might even point to Mark Geyer, who's one of the people uh, who's here today, who is uh, playing some sort of uh, uh, ambassadorial role with some of the funding agencies. He's from NIH. But um, because there is a desire to connect with different funding agencies and just share what's going on. And obviously, the funding agencies will be their own thing. and will have to make their own decisions. But uh, we, we realize that funding agencies are key in even working that issue. Okay. Thanks, David. Barthi, you've got a question. Then I've got <laughs> almost the whole steering committee wanting to talk. <laughs> okay. So after Barthi, we'll go to the middle of the room. <laughs> my, my question is on your last uh, or second to last slide. Uh, before um, all the names of all the persons who are working with you. The Global Unique Identifiers is, an, is a concept and an, uh, an ideal that the International Rare Diseases Research Consortium is also looking at for the particular, because of the particular nature of rare disease um, uh, communities and their needs, more sharing and, and so on. Have you, or are you envisaging, in addition to contacting the REWG if you have any policy issues, but have you thought about working across um, with the ERDRC uh, Research Consortium on this issue? Yes, there was a, there was a whole a thread where we uh, talked about the other um, notions of identifier that the other groups uh, were pioneering and uh, their strong intention to engage and make sure that we are uh, taking advantage of everything. But this, this is a, the one that David was talking about was really it's about a specific data set. It would change if you made some changes to the calls or the sequence calls. So this is a... a so we're having a language issue here so with it, two different yes. tools being built, but for different purposes, but with a similar idea of unique identifiers. That's yeah. right? Yeah. That's right. Okay. Okay. So Richard's very important point. This is not about identifying a person. It's yes. about identifying a data set produced from a sample. Okay. So. You're just seeing live demonstration of one of our uh, recurring needs within the alliance is not to always think in four silos. Being an organization that breaks down silos, inappropriate, we think. It, so this cross-cutting between our working groups, making sure they're using the same language, because all four right now are talking about some form of unique identifier. From the middle of the room. I, yeah, I think it's, it's a follow-up question. I'm at Adele Lawi working at the small uh, startup company, uh, Portable Genomics. Dave and Richard, it's actually a follow-up question with this uh, global abstract uh, uh, identifier. So first of all, it's really, again, from security-wise, I think the technology is going to be used to encrypt actually this unique identifier. Is, it, is there any bridge to make it reversible so you can obviously have then access back to the, 
ge genetic information. And the second is really the, what the, the application you are looking for, so for what purpose? It's, it's purposely one way, it's a one way hash. Uh, there would be, have to be another uh, mechanism to get back to the actual genetic information if you wanted to do that, but we view it as an advantage of having the possibility of it being strictly one way. Uh, that's a privacy issue and uh, as other, you know, there are other considerations. So, but, but you can add a second way to go back. Uh, there would have to be a, a call of some sort. Yes. You have to discover, discover So, it. in terms of application there, so for what purpose I think well, are you developing? Uh, I think David listed some of the purposes. It allows you to um, check that you've got what you think you've got, to, if you're wanting to talk with somebody else about the same data set, Rather than transfer the whole d data set so they could compare it, you can exchange this, this uh, content, this hash, essentially content uh, uh, describing identifier. Uh, it allows you to, uh, if you've drawn some clinical inference from a piece of data or research inference, you can say exactly what the data set was that you used to draw that, and then you can uh, not get confused by going to some other version um, uh, later right. in time. So. Uh, there's a whole set of applications, and in fact, the whole management of the way that data gets moved around is enabled by uh, having, a, having that. So, take the last question from Kazatel. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, first of all, congratulate on the enormous amount of work. And uh, then I'd like to ask how you plan to make these tools available to really global research and society, community, um, say Indian community, uh, Thai, Malaysian, and it seems you have a lot of experts yes. from so the, Western uh, countries. So the idea is that the tools are available to anybody who can get on the internet. And the membership in a task team is also available to anybody that can get on the internet. Uh, it's based on what you actually contribute. So. You yeah, could making, have a, making tools is okay, but uh, making them available may need some um, deliberate, active yes, effort to Yes, to we, need, we need educational, we need yeah. outreach. Very yes. good point. Yes, I understand where you're coming from now. That is uh, definitely a, a phase that we need to enter into because awareness and outreach and explaining to people how you would use these things is so important. And I think once we have a reference implementation completed uh, that is easy to download and set up and so forth, we'll be in a better position to reach out. But, Thank you. I mean, I think it's also not though just about the API and the new tools. The, uh, the Global Alliance has adopted the, the existing standards which are used, I, I think, in, in Thailand and Malaysia and Japan, the, the, the BAM and, and VCF formats. And that, that's been actually a really constructive thing to both harden those yes. and... Uh, I, I, think, I think demonstrating some yeah. actual benefits using some case which we are going, working on would be very beneficial to, to say that this, these are useful. Okay. Yes. And the very last question. Hi, Augusto Random from Genomics England. Um, I have a question regarding benchmarking, and is if from uh, your discussions, I suppose yesterday, if there's a need for more gold standard data sets, say, as, as there is a platinum genomes, perhaps a higher, a different type of platinum genomes, things like that. Yes, that came up. The, uh, there are some genomes that are fundamentally haploid that can be sequenced very deeply and uh, extremely accurately. Uh, we would like to see several of those. Uh, there are need, we need to expand into benchmarks in RNA, seq, and other areas as well. So there, there's uh, enormous uh, growth potential in benchmarking but and we'd, a lot of exciting. In fact, the leader of the benchmarking group, Justin Zuko, one of the yes, leaders Justin. Is, uh, is at the National Institute of Standards in yeah. the U.S. and uh, there's the Genomes in a Bottle initiative that's aligned uh, fully with this. Right. So I'll close with that, unless either of you have got a final comment to make? No. Nope. So thank you. Uh, they're relatively easy to spot in a crowd <laughs> because of the height. Um, so I would encourage you to find them over the break. And uh, we'll move with that to our fourth working of our initial working groups.